Hear me okay? Okay. Um, this is a session of lightning talks. So there's a number of us here who have five minutes to, to share something that we think is interesting. Um, mine is sort of a soul-searching confessional about trying to use map data to solve a really hard problem and having a harder time about it than I thought there might be. And I'm going to read from some notes because it's a big story to get into five minutes. So um, I'm with Loveland Technologies. We're based just down the street. We're a Detroit-based property mapping and data company. Um, Loveland maps nationwide property information at the parcel level at makeloveland.com. But I'm not going to talk too much about that today. Please do check it out, though. We've got a lot of really great parcel data and cool mapping tools. Um, I've got five minutes to tell a big story, so I'm going to jump into it. This is a map of around 150,000 Detroit tax foreclosures that were auctioned between 2002 and 2016. 50,000 of them were occupied homes, housing maybe 100 to 150,000 people. And for those here who don't know whether or not this is normal, this is not normal. This is about a third of properties in the city that have gone through this process. The way tax foreclosure works in Michigan, if you owe any amount of property taxes from three years ago, the county forecloses and auctions your property. Here's a graph of tax foreclosures by year in Detroit back to 2005. You can see it take off after 2008, and most have actually happened since we filed for bankruptcy. You can see a dip in the last few years for reasons I'll discuss, but if you look here, you'll see the number of foreclosure notices going out is not dropping in the same way. People are struggling and overpaying delinquent tax debts. For years back to 2010, Loveland has been mapping tax foreclosure data, and as it's seemingly gone on forever, we've moved from becoming mappers to deeper advocates for changing the system. This has not been as easy as you might think with a problem this obvious. I think we have an assumption as map makers and data people that if you can provide good data about a problem, that the powers that be will get to work on solving it. I thought we had this problem in the bag back in 2014. We had just completed a citywide property survey with the Motor City Mapping Project, looking at the land use, occupancy, and condition of every single property in Detroit, largely for identifying and eliminating blight. One of the major findings was that tax foreclosure actually is the blight pipeline in the city. There's a whole section of the blight report about tax foreclosures negative effects in the city. Many tax foreclosures are occupied. When they get sold at auction, people leave. Or they get evicted. The properties go vacant. Weather and scrappers get in. And a family home becomes a candidate for demolition owned by a speculative auction buyer. We showed this in a series of follow-up reports and surveys, which you can see at makeloveland.com reports. We visited occupied foreclosures a year later to assess vacancy, and we interviewed occupants shortly after their homes were sold to ask about their situations. It was not a pretty picture. Emerging from bankruptcy, three of the city's main goals became grow the population, eliminate blight, and build one city for all of us that doesn't displace poor and vulnerable people. Tax foreclosure clearly works against all those goals, and it seemed obvious we were about to cut it out. Things became more politically complicated as the post-bankruptcy mood understandably turned towards accentuating the positive. No one wanted to talk about or look at nasty things like foreclosures or believe that homes could still be going vacant at a rate similar to the number of homes being torn down. It just seemed like stinking thinking. The only thing that started to move the needle was getting more aggressive in our approach and in investigation and our advocacy. In November of 2015, so little was happening to address foreclosure that I actually ran for treasurer during a special selection process. The platform I put forward largely centered on two things, comprehensive door-to-door -door outreach to reach, assist, and understand every single person and property at risk of foreclosure, and an end to auctioning occupied homes. We have had success in implementing and helping others implement these programs, and it has had a major impact, though it has absolutely been like pulling teeth in a way that I have no time to describe. Now every year there are major canvassing efforts by community organizations like the United Community Housing Coalition and the Quicken Loans Community Investment Fund that result in many people getting onto payment plans 
and many occupied homes entering buyback programs. The Coalition to End Unconstitutional Tax Foreclosure also runs a program to give land bank houses to people who lost theirs for overassessed taxes. But we're also facing something much bigger and deeper and tougher than just wanting to reduce tax delinquency. After years of trying to figure this all out, it has only recently come to light just how much the county relies on the surpluses it makes from delinquent taxes and the auction. Since 2009, the county has generated more than $300 million it would not have had if people paid their taxes on time. And about half of that came since Detroit entered bankruptcy. It currently generates 30 to $40 million a year and helps the county remain solvent. So allow me to underline that for a second. If everyone in Detroit paid their property taxes on time to the city, then the county would be in a worse financial condition. This is not a strong incentive to solve the problem. So now we find ourselves in an awkward position. We can track all the data we want, but it isn't appreciated by many of the people with the power to make change. It's actually viewed as antagonistic and threatening to reveal the situation for what it is. For example, here is an uncomfortable map of citywide property tax delinquency from last summer. This summer it looked the same. I'm sorry to say at this point, in my opinion, the main things that are driving structural changes are lawsuits and working to change laws. The ACLU recently settled a lawsuit with the city over overassessed taxes and a lack of access to poverty tax exemption programs. Yes, many people were foreclosed after being charged too much or were not supposed to be paying property taxes in the first place. I have no idea how this is going to end or how history will look back at it and how the role of data and data practitioners will be viewed in solving or not solving it. But I know that people are going to write books about it and it would probably make a great movie and I do believe it will one day be widely known as a cautionary tale of political history and identified as a catastrophe worthy of some kind of reparations. That's the size of the picture I can paint in five minutes. I hope it helps you reflect on our role as map makers and data people and the challenges we can face when our efforts to make the world a better place are frustrated, when seeing isn't solving, and we need to work outside of the map to make things happen in ways we never expected. I think that's the end of my five minutes. So if you want to contact me, you can reach me at jerry at makeloveland.com if you're interested in discussing more. And you can see our site and more of our work at makeloveland.com. Um, and th lastly, thank you to everybody in the Detroit data community for getting the ship off the ground. It has been quite a ride in Detroit over the last decade. And it's nice to share that story with you. Thank you. Thank you.